106.5, it's time now for Front Page Jacksonville, a show that delves into the issues that affect you. We believe in transparency and providing only the facts. And now, here's Octavius Davis. Duval, we made it. Helene tried to come through here and ravage our homes, but we made it. Jacksonville. Helene did not wash us away. We made it through another hurricane that's come through our way. And I'm glad that we're still here. Hopefully you and your loved ones didn't experience any severe property damage, any harm, of course. Hope that you and your family experienced no harm whatsoever. Um, but man, I do know that there were some significant power outages uh, throughout the city. So hopefully those have been uh, cleared up for you and your loved ones now. I know uh, there in my home, we had a tree come down, which I had to deal with yesterday. Uh, thankfully, no power outages, but man, we're still here. Hopefully no loss of life. I haven't heard of any loss of life uh, here in the city of Jacksonville. But um, there in Pinellas County, uh, they were hit pretty hard. So I've been monitoring that very closely because with my day job, I travel quite a bit to Pinellas County, uh, Clearwater, St. Petersburg, Largo, Florida, if you're familiar with those areas, right outside of Tampa. Uh, I spend a significant amount of time there, um, you know, throughout the month uh, with my day job. So definitely sending uh, thoughts and prayers to the families who are dealing with some significant um, water damage, property damage, and uh, I'm even hearing of some loss of life down that way as well. And, you know, interestingly, I was supposed to be down there this weekend. And so I chose to cancel my travels. I believe on Wednesday is when I officially canceled my travels just based on how I saw the trajectory of the storm. And I was like, nah, I don't think this is going to be a good idea. I'm going to stay home and make certain that I can be available to my wife and our children. Uh, there, And I was told that the events that I was headed down that way to support were going to still move forward. But Friday got word that they decided to go ahead and cancel those things as well, which I'm glad they did, uh, because it's definitely not worth putting anyone at risk uh, for any, um, you know, for for an event, you know, with, with a storm of that magnitude that was coming through. So let's continue to keep... Uh, those individuals impacted through the storm, of course, in the Gulf Coast region, uh, the Big Bend area. Uh, and here's the here's the other part of that. Uh, we're not out of the woods just yet. Uh, I'm hearing there's two, maybe three more storms. I believe two. I believe there are two more storms that are preparing to uh, come through our area or at least is beginning to form uh, out there uh, over the water between now and and October 11th, I believe, is when uh, those storms are expected to, you know, fully materialize into whatever whatever they're going to be. So um, be sure to continue to remain vigilant as we endure this hurricane season. It is hurricane season, and I believe hurricane season continues through late November. Uh, so even if it's just a tropical depression even if it doesn't fully materialize into a hurricane, we still want to make sure that we are doing our diligence uh, to make sure that we and our loved ones are safe. So I had to open things up with a little bit of Keith Wonderboy Johnson. We made it through the storm. All right, it's, it's Sunday here on Hot 106.5, you know, and, you know, we have, uh, is it Gospel Inspirations? Sunday Morning Inspirations. Sunday Morning Inspirations with your host, Wanda P., and, and uh, Wanda is uh, my producer, training a new producer, Jack. Shout out to Jack, uh, get him being our, will soon be our new producer for Front Page Jacksonville. But Wanda P is currently uh, producing and, and training Jack. Wanda, did I ever tell you the story about me and Keith Wonderboy Johnson? I don't, I don't, I don't think I did either. So, so I will share with you, the audience, and Wanda, you will have an opportunity to listen in. So uh, Keith Wonderboy Johnson, may he rest in peace. I know he passed away a few years ago. 
but there is an event that uh, I think came to Jacksonville maybe last year or the year before, uh, Gospel Superfest. It was a year ago this week. Last year. <laughs> last year, Gospel Superfest <laughs> came to Jacksonville. Well, I'm going to rewind the clock. Um, back when Gospel Superfest uh, was first coming to Jacksonville in the early 2000s, uh, 2002 ish, somewhere up in there. Uh, the creator and executive producer, Dr. Bobby Cartwright, a uh, great friend, a- amazing gentleman, uh, have had an opportunity to build a relationship with him throughout the years. Well, back during that time, uh, I was also a hip hop choreographer. And so Mr. Uh, Dr. Cartwright let me know about different artists throughout the Gospel Superfest that he needed some background dancers for. Okay, great. Not a problem. Got you covered. Well, long story short, Keith Wonderboy Johnson, if you're not familiar with Keith Keith Wonderboy Johnson and his music, in the gospel genre, Keith Wonderboy Johnson is classified as a quartet singer. All right. Now, there is nothing hip hop whatsoever about quartet music. Nothing (laughs) at all. Okay. And so this particular segment of the Gospel Superfest, they were filming for their Christmas special. So it's Christmas music that this quartet, Keith Wonderboy Johnson, is singing for. I don't know what the communication was between the production crew and Keith Wonderboy Johnson, but I don't think he was aware that three guys were going to magically appear behind him doing a poor rendition of quartet lip syncing and mild dancing. And so this is live. They're they're recording it live. And so myself and two of my buddies who the floor director just pointed us to go, we had no clue what we were doing. It was a debacle. I mean, it was a hot mess. When the show actually aired, and I'm glad they pre-recorded it, but when the show actually aired, they didn't even do a close-up of us. It was like a, a distant pan view. And I only think they did that once, which was very wise of them to not put us on camera. And Keith looked so confused. Like, what is, who are these cats? Hey, man, I don't know. We're just here, okay? We, we just sat where they told us to sit and do what they told us to do. So uh, Keith Wonderboy Johnson, may he rest in peace. And uh, please never try to dance to a quartet song. It's not going to play out very well for you. Yeah, even his Christmas song is quartet-ish. Everything oh, about Keith yeah. Wonderboy is quartet-ish, you know. But, hey, you know, I, I just did what I was asked to do. <laughs> and you're listening to Front Page Jacksonville. I'm your host, Octavius Davis. Uh, thank you so much for joining me this morning, this Sunday morning. A lot of different things that are happening throughout the city. Going to have some guests that will be here with us today as well during the 7 o'clock hour. So I'm looking forward to having a chance to uh, speak with you on those different things. Uh, Before we look at some of the things that are impacting us here in Jacksonville, I want to take a 10,000-foot view and look at a couple of things that are happening either nationally or throughout the state. Uh, The first thing I want to bring up, which I think is a pretty cool story uh, to kick things off, Jalen Brown. Are you familiar with Jalen Brown, the shooting guard for the Boston Celtics? Jalen Brown is preparing to launch his very own shoe. Now, some people were attempting to give him flack because he turned down a $50 million deal from Nike. And when Jalen was interviewed about why he decided to come out with his own shoe, my man said very simple, well, you know, I want to do something different. Everything else out there right now is boring. It's boring. So what I want to do is show other athletes, other creators, other designers that they don't have to rely on these traditional means, meaning, you know, major shoe manufacturers to, to get their name out there, to get their product out there. So he's preparing to launch his own shoe. Uh, it's called the 741 Performance Rover. And the, the shoe doesn't look bad at all. It, it doesn't look bad. It, it looks a little moonish, which rightfully so. 741 Performance Rover, it's, you know, I guess he's playing off the whole uh, space theme. But the first thing that I was curious about was, okay, how much we talking, Jalen? Mm-hmm. How much money we talking? And, and price point wise, it's not all that bad. It's kind of comparable to what we see out there in the market. So, Men's sizes, $200. That's 
That's not bad, right? Grade school size, uh, or, or rather grade school shoes, 70 bucks. Now, that's where I'm most impressed. With. That's what I'm most impressed with. Because grade school, I'm thinking middle school, elementary school, uh, those shoe prices can get real crazy very quickly. 70 bucks, that's, that's palatable. Now, if you don't know a lot about Jalen Brown, let me just give you a little insight into Mr. Brown. So Jalen Brown is uh, one of the uh, top players in the NBA, if I'm not mistaken, uh, the Boston Celtics. And, and Jack, if you're familiar with, with sports, if I'm, if I'm off base at all, please correct me. But if, if memory serves me correctly, the Boston Celtics won the NBA championship this past season. Jalen Brown received the Most Valuable Player Award this past season during the NBA Finals. The young man has skills. Mm -hmm. But despite him being the league MVP, at least for the, the finals, despite him being a part of the world championship Boston Celtics basketball team, Jalen Brown was not invited to play on Team USA this past summer during the Summer Olympics. Mr. Brown also does not see many of the endorsement deals that other players throughout the league receive either. And it's caused a lot of people to speculate as to why this is the case. And there is a rhyme to this reason. Mr. Brown is not, he's not a media darling. He's, he's not overly uh, charismatic. He doesn't have this, you know, overbearing personality or persona that will, quote unquote, sell. Let me put that a different way. His personality ain't very sexy. All right. But. Here's another interesting tidbit. When he was preparing to go into the NBA draft, I think he got drafted in the 2018 class. Uh, there was a general manager, and the general manager's name was not disclosed in the story, but there was a general manager that said, uh, I think he's too smart to play in the NBA. He's a little too intelligent to play in the National Basketball Association. Well, what does that mean? Why would a general manager refer to Jalen Brown, the MVP of the finals, one of the top shooting guards in the NBA, as being too smart? Well, let me give you a little bit about his educational resume. He graduated at the top of his high school class. When he graduated, he went on to Berkeley. And he took a master's level course for cultural studies of sports and education as a freshman at Berkeley. He's also fluent in several different languages, including Spanish and Arabic. He made the varsity chess team at Cal. He is a recipient of the MIT Media Lab Fellow. I don't know what that means, okay? The, the, the award itself sounds smart. I don't know what that means, but he received that fellowship from MIT. He is the youngest person in the history of Harvard University to give a lecture. He is the vice president of the National Basketball uh, Players Association, the youngest in history. And... He has interned at NASA. Now, I'm be honest with you. I'm gonna be honest with you. That last one, that one, that one don't impress me too much. And, I, and I'm gonna tell you why, okay? Because our very own Wanda P, she interned at NASA, okay? So, Jalen, I'm gonna, be, I'm gonna keep it real with you. Man, that, that last one, okay. All right, the MIT Media Lab fellow, the youngest lecturer at Harvard. Okay, I give you that. But, but NASA, Wanda P. was an intern at NASA. All right? So I think she can take you on the basketball court. Oh, 
<laughs> right? But the young man is brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. And so I want to encourage you, uh, if you're not familiar with Jalen Brown, Google Jalen Brown as well as 741 Performance Rover. Support. Support, support, support. I'm going to definitely support. I will be getting a pair of his shoes because I think it's I think it's dope of what he's attempting to do uh, with bringing his own shoe uh, to the market. So much more is on the way. We're going to have an opportunity to talk about what in the world is going on with Florida Blue and Baptist Health. What are they dealing with right now? We'll talk about that in just a moment. Also, Amendment 3. Do you know what's going on with Amendment 3? Are you familiar with Amendment 3? We're going to dive into that in just a little bit on the other side. Now back to the show that informs you and discusses the issues. Front Page Jacksonville on Hot 1065. 833-758-1065 is the number to call if you'd like to hop on Front Page Jacksonville with your thoughts and comments. 833-758-1065. Well, Duval, once November comes around, we are going to have some decisions to make in the voter booth. Not just about the presidential election. There are several different amendments that are going to be on the ballot. One in particular that stands out to me is Amendment 3. What are your thoughts on Amendment 3? And if you aren't familiar with Amendment 3, let me share some very quick high-level points about Amendment 3. Amendment 3 allow adults 21 years or older to possess, purchase, or use marijuana products and marijuana accessories for non-medical personal consumption by smoking, ingestion, or otherwise. It allows medical marijuana treatment centers and other state licensed entities to acquire, cultivate, process, manufacture, sell, and distribute such products and accessories. Basically, legalized marijuana for recreational use is what Amendment 3 is all about. Now, we may know individuals who use uh, medical marijuana, right? This isn't that. This is individuals being able to enjoy, enjoy their weed how they choose to enjoy their weed as long as they're 21 years or older and are responsible with it there's a certain there's a limit to the the amount of grams that the individual will be able to possess and so forth what are your thoughts on that what are your thoughts on recreational legalized recreational use of marijuana here in the state of florida 833-758-1065 833-758-1065 is the number to call if you'd like to jump in with your thoughts and comments Here's my immediate thought. And this is not the first time that something like this has come about here in our country. But it's always interesting to me when I see, I'm going to call it criminalized behavior, eventually become legalized. And it's no longer criminal. As a matter of fact, it's profitable. And because it's profitable, because it can now be taxed, it's no longer criminal. Amendment 3 reminds me of uh, Prohibition. From 1920 to 1933, it was illegal to produce, import, transport, and sell alcoholic beverages. For 13 years, alcohol was illegal in the United States. But you know what? I got to thinking. If prohibition didn't take place until 1920, if alcohol wasn't illegal until 1920, what happened in 1919? What about 1918? Were these products illegal in 1915? They weren't. They were not. Alcohol production, importation, transportation, and sale of alcoholic beverages were not illegal before 1920. As a matter of fact, the 18th Amendment 
was ratified January 19th of 1919. That ratified amendment is what caused alcohol to become illegal. That's what started prohibition. So when the 18th Amendment was, was ratified in 1919 and 1920, it took effect. Now, individuals who are selling hooch, running hooch, <laughs> it was illegal. It was illegal. So think about how many individuals were uh, jailed for running hooch during Prohibition. And then in 1934, because Prohibition ended in 1933, so let's say in 1934, well, now it's no longer illegal. Now those individuals who were criminalized, who were jailed because they were a part of this activity, well, now in 1934, the good old U.S. of A. is able to make money off of it. So it's not illegal no more. It's, it's cool now. All right, hey, hey, no, 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 no. This, this, is, this is good by us. Well, now let's talk about Amendment 3. And I'm thinking about in my own life, and I ask that you do the same for yourself. How many people do you know over the past 20 years, 10 years, five years, who have been arrested for possession of marijuana. And I'm not talking about, you know, anyone who has barrels of marijuana in their vehicle. All right, I'm not talking about someone who has a barn of hemp. All right, we're speaking about somebody got a little, they, they had a little something in their pockets. Well, it's illegal. How many people do you know who have been arrested for possession? I know plenty. In my own family. If Amendment 3 passes, <clears throat> it will no longer be illegal. All will be right with the world. The amendment's financial impact primarily comes from expected sales tax collections. If legal today, sales of non-medical marijuana would be subject to sales tax and would remain so if voters approve this amendment. Based on other states' experiences, expected real, uh, excuse me, expected retail sales of non-medical marijuana could generate at least $195.6 million annually in state, almost $200 million annually is what could potentially be generated in the state if we vote yes on Amendment 3. And I'll be candid. I'm not, I'm not for or against it. You know, it's, it's whatever suits your fancy. I know people who utilize uh, marijuana, uh, the, the medical marijuana, you know, and, and rightfully so, because I've seen the effects of these individuals before utilizing the medical marijuana, and I see how it helps alleviate the pain once they've had an opportunity to, to use it. So again, I'm not for or against it, but it is something that I always kind of look at. I'm like, oh, as long as you can make a dollar off of it, US of A, it's all good. And so that then opens the door to another question in my mind. Let's say the state of Florida says yes to Amendment 3. Amendment 3 is all right with me. Does that mean individuals who are currently imprisoned for possession, will that be overturned? Will that charge be expunged off their records? If, if those charges are deemed, if they have a felony on their, on their record, is it going to go away? Will these individuals, if they've lost 
their civil rights in terms of being able to vote and things of that nature? Will it be restored? The, these are the questions that are in my, that are in my head. I, I can't, my mind won't allow me, my conscience won't allow me to look at an amendment like Amendment 3 and say, ooh, this can generate almost $200 million for the state of Florida and not think about the people, the families whom have been impacted through the quote-unquote illegal possession of the very same thing that the state is looking to profit off of. Let me state this on the front end in case it's not clear. I am not pro selling drugs. I, I'm not saying that I'm an advocate of street pharmaceuticals. However, I am looking at just the dynamic because the state sees this as an opportunity to profit. The street pharmacists saw it as an opportunity to profit for some feed their families. So granted, it's illegal. There are consequences that comes along with breaking the law. I get that. But when it becomes legal or if it becomes legal, what happens to the charges for those individuals who were previously arrested for what used to be an illegal activity? I'm curious about that. What are your thoughts? 833-758-1065. That's 833-758-1065 is the number to call to jump on front page Jacksonville and share your thoughts as it relates to Amendment 3. I've always wondered about this, and I'm going to do some additional research because, I, honestly, I have no clue how this works on the back end. I have no clue what happened to those individuals who were arrested for selling hooch back in Prohibition. No clue. What happened after it was no longer illegal? What will happen if Amendment 3 does pass? Here is what I, what I think is a very important caveat. I want to go back to what I was explaining with what Amendment 3 is. It allows adults 21 years or older to possess, purchase, or use marijuana products and marijuana accessories for non-medical personal consumption by smoking, ingestion, or otherwise. Allows medical marijuana treatment centers and other state licensed entities other state licensed entities to acquire, cultivate, process, manufacture, and distribute such products and accessories. So if Amendment 3 does pass, if if your homeboy or your homegirl, all right, let me let me let me let me bring it bring it home. The plug. Huh? If Amendment 3 plant passes, you can't simply go to your plug, the plug, your hookup, and, and get your recreational fix. Can't do that. That will probably still be illegal. As a matter of fact, I'm going to step further out on the limb and say, yeah, that's going to still be illegal. <laughs> I'm going to take the probably out of it. That's going to still be illegal. Why? Because medical marijuana treatment centers and other state licensed entities. I got a sneaking suspicion the plug ain't going to be state licensed. So there will still be parameters in place that will need to be followed even for recreational use. The other part that I'm not certain of, but I will need to research further. Let's say the plug wants to go straight, wants to be on the up and up with their marijuana business, we'll call it that. Will they be able to get a state license to then 
distribute legally? I don't know. Will they be able to open up a, a cannabis store and distribute products as long as they have a state license? I don't know. But I think that Amendment 3, just on the surface, I, I see what they're portraying on the surface, but there are many other questions that are underneath that that I really believe uh, require some investigating. Um, whether we vote yes or no, whatever we decide to vote, we need to further understand the pros and the cons of this amendment. And honestly, all the other amendments that are on the ballot as well. Because I just chose to pull Amendment 3, but there are other amendments on the ballot that we'll have to vote on come November. But it's our responsibility to do our diligence and not simply take the talking points that we see on the commercials, that we hear about in the news. No, we have to dig a little bit deeper. A statement that I often say, questions are the answers to our problems. And so anytime we find ourselves facing a situation, a story, an amendment, a candidate, allow those questions to continue to saturate your mind. Because if we follow the question trail, it's going to help us find the answers that will also help us solve whatever that challenge is that we're facing. So again, I just chose to pick Amendment 3. There are plenty other amendments uh, that I could have chosen, but this Amendment 3, it, it hits close to home for me because as I stated, uh, I have loved ones who use medical marijuana. I have loved ones who have been arrested for possessing marijuana. I'm not talking about no Rick Ross level you know, rapper induced keys of weed or anything like that. No, I'm just talking about, you know, a few, a few, a few little leaves in the pocket. But nonetheless, they had it on them. They had possession and it's illegal. So how will this impact individuals if Amendment 3 is passed? How will it impact their future? Florida has just told us how it will impact the state of Florida's economic future. $200 million annually is what they're projecting. And I got to be honest, that sounds a little low. That sounds a little low. That sounds very low. So I'm sure the economic impact is going to be larger than that for the state of Florida. What will the impact be for those individuals who have a previous charge? Will they have an opportunity at um, restitution? Will they have an opportunity to say, hey, look, yeah, I, I was involved in this particular situation, but I'm not a bad person. 833-758-1065 is the number to call. Again, that's 833-758-1065. One zero six five. We have a caller on the line. Caller, you're on the air. Hey, how are you? I'm excellent, thank you. How about yourself? Oh, good. I love this topic. My favorite topic. Uh, what, what's your name? James. Hey, James. Uh, thanks so much for calling Front Page Jacksonville. What are your thoughts about Amendment Three? All right, so I'm from Boston. I'm coming down here. It's Jacks moving, and I can tell you that we are fully legal in Massachusetts and it's a uh, <clears throat> it's a game changer mm. for the city in a lot of different ways I'd say the number one thing though is that you know the big the big issue that we had there was people saying well this is gonna open up the gateway drug mm. for kids and for families and the reality is the gateway drug is when these kids are going to their their dealer yeah and the dealers turn around and saying, hey, try this fentanyl. I mean, that's the gateway. Wow. You know, I get kids, and I prefer them to do marijuana than I would alcohol, that's for sure. Sure. So I would say, I would say that, you know, the reality is, uh, on the religious front, this is a God's plan, right? So 
I would say that's that's one thing. But again, you know, it, it definitely will help the economy. Yep. You know, it's going to take away a lot of that. You know, kind of kind of un- underground marijuana dealer that's probably lacing sure their drug with you know harder drugs to get those kids impacted more and you know create a stream of revenue for them so that you know that'll go away for the most part and james that's a great point i didn't even think about that dynamic about uh, i guess you can say clean marijuana um if it is legalized through the state and helping to reduce the fact of dealers lacing their product a a quick question for you you mentioned that uh, legalizing it in massachusetts was a game changer uh, for you all there what are some of the things that you saw both the pros and some of the cons uh, when it became legal okay so you want to talk about the economy right i think you had mentioned like you know we're going to legalize marijuana because it's going to help the economy well it does i mean it's going to create a lot of money and that that can be a good thing if that money is you know repatriated back to the community you know, you can set that money up to help with other harder drugs and getting those people off those drugs and like community centers and things like that. But you know, you're going to make sure that your governor and your mayor, you know, put that in the right place. You know, the other piece of it is again, you know, you're going to have a lot of people that had been arrested for this. You know, as long as it's not a violent crime, you know, those people should be expunged, right? They should all you know, come right out of jail for that stuff. That's all nonsense. Did you see that happen in Massachusetts? Well, you know, that piece of it is, is, you know, it's challenging. You know, I think that case by case is a lot of people that were arrested for that stuff. So, you know, I don't really know the ins and outs of all that, but that's the way it should be logically. Right. Agreed. I do agree. Absolutely. James, I'm absolutely loving uh, the, the insight that you're giving us. Uh, We're getting ready to cut away for a break. Uh, Any final thoughts for yourself on the amendment three topic? You know, good luck to the state. I think it's a great thing if it passes. I'm sure it will, actually. I think by flying colors. Well, Have thank, a great day. Uh, thanks, James. Appreciate you calling in and hanging out with us today here on Front Page Jacksonville. Uh, feel free to call in as well if you have thoughts, 833-758-1065. That's 833-758-1065. I'm Octavius Davis, and you are listening to Front Page Jacksonville. We'll be back in just a moment. Front page Jacksonville resumes on Hot 1065. Man, James, thanks so much for calling in. Still thinking about our discussion. So many questions have just been entering my mind. We were speaking about Amendment 3. If you're not familiar with Amendment 3, I'll give you a quick overview. Uh, Amendment 3 in the state of Florida will be on the ballot come November for your vote to determine whether or not uh, marijuana consumption for recreational purposes will become legal. And if we choose to vote yes on Amendment 3, individuals such as medical marijuana treatment centers and other state licensed entities will be able to acquire, cultivate, process, manufacture, sell, and distribute products and accessories for marijuana. James, he's here in Jacksonville, but uh, is from Massachusetts and shared that there in Massachusetts, marijuana is legal for recreational use. And he brought up a great point. One of the things that he mentioned is that one of the pros with legalized recreational marijuana usage is that it eliminates laced product from the plug. Excellent point. And so during the break, I was continuing to think about that. And I was like, wow, so what will the regulations look like if Amendment 3 does pass? Will the FDA, the Food and Drug Administration, will they get involved in that process to ensure that these state licensed entities, that these medical marijuana treatment centers are uh, up to code, making sure that they aren't lacing (laughs) any of their products to ensure that customers are getting a clean product? What are your thoughts? 833-758-1065. That's 833-758-1065 to jump in on the conversation. Florida Blue, Baptist Health, what are you doing? What is going on? If you have not heard, Florida Blue and Baptist Health have been gridlocked in negotiations. We are days from the current contract between those two entities from expiring. 
October 1st. That's Tuesday. That's this Tuesday. The parties are still undergoing contract negotiations, and if they cannot agree, if they can't come to an agreement by October 1st, Baptist Health will be considered out of network for some 600,000 Florida Blue customers across the region. I don't understand health insurance lingo. I don't understand or know what it takes to run a hospital. That's above my pay grade. <laughs> and it's, it's definitely a, above my knowledge base. But me and my family, we're part of that 600,000. We're part of that number. So I know just in my own home, the effects and impact that would echo if they aren't able to come to an agreement. According to Baptist Health, Florida Blue made it clear that they are not interested in negotiating, but they did request a 30-day extension to the current contract. Now, as for Baptist Health, they maintain that they have taken too many costs with workforce shortages, record inflation, and rising costs of drugs and supplies. All of that is coming into play. She wants to talk about number three. All of that is coming into play from their side of the fence. All I know is I need some insurance. I need to make sure that when I go get my physical, my checkup, if I have some kind of situation going on and I need to get to the AER, I need to make sure I got medical insurance. <laughs> we have a caller on the line. We're going to circle back to Amendment 3. Caller, you're on the air. Welcome to Front Page Jacksonville. Good morning. Good morning. How are you today? I'm good in yourself. How are you? I'm well, thank you. What's your name? My name is Natalie. Hey, Natalie. What are your thoughts on Amendment 3? Um, I am definitely for Amendment 3. Um, I did hear your your comments and, you know, your thoughts about it. Sure. Um, so biggest point you've made, um, you know, with alcohol uh, being illegal. Um, so definitely I see no reason, you know, for marijuana not to be legal. Sure. Um, and number two biggest thing is that it's helping people. Yeah. Um, so versus, like you said, you can walk in the store, you can purchase alcohol, you can purchase cigarettes. You've never, at least I've never heard of anyone dying from smoking marijuana. Mm. Um, of course you have. So that's the other biggest thing. Like you can walk in the store now and purchase something that can definitely kill you, uh, meaning alcohol, yeah. uh, cigarettes, yeah. lung cancer. Um, so it's like, how can you walk in the store and purchase alcohol and cigarettes. And to me, marijuana is just all in the same category. And now, um, like, to me, you, the marijuana is much safer. And, and do you mind if I add another product to that list that you just mentioned of things that are more dangerous than marijuana? Sure, definitely. Vape pens. Oh, definitely. Vaping definitely. is a huge health oh. risk. Beyond what I believe many people fully understand. But to your point, you can walk into your your local gas station dispensary and grab a vape pen with no problem. No problem. Something that will, like you said, definitely take you out now. Yep. Um, it's like you said, been on, on the news more. Um, so to me, it's just always been crazy. Like, yeah, like, of course, the marijuana is something that's grown, um, you know, to, to start off there, too. It's not. I mean, I know you like you said, you have people down. Like you were saying, your plugs, you know, sure, people yeah. that actually <laughs> take marijuana right. and, you know, mix it with the fentanyl. And so, you know, I'm not, you know, like you just like you were saying, you know, I'm not, a, um, you know, agreeing with that part of it. Because um, like you said, unfortunately, you do have people out here just like with any other, you know, drug that's illegal that, you know, will mix stuff, you know, with other illegal drugs that can definitely, you know, kill you or, you know, could harm you. Um, but as far as, like you said, it becoming legal you know, being able to go in a dispenser, you know, like you said, it helps. It helps with definitely medical issues. Um, you know, I've personally, you know, been a user. Um, so like I said, it, it definitely helps medical things for me. Absolutely. Um, you know, medical uh, wise. 
So, yeah, I think it's, it's something that should have been been illegal. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Has should have been legal. Sure. Um, like you said, just like like you said, vape pen. Like those things, I think should be taken off of the shelf. Fully. So it's agree. like you know we're discussing Amendment Three, um, but definitely, like you said, has benefits to it. You know, unlike alcohol, vape pen, cigarettes. But you know, biggest thing. Who 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 you have you ever heard passed away from smoking marijuana? <laughs> Uh, uh, like, uh, I've just never, uh, unless it never made heard it to of the anyone news. dying from marijuana. Right. Uh, unless it never made it to the news, you know? And, and, and that part, that part. That and part. so there, there, are, there are so many different, uh, well, I'll put it this way. I'm glad that the conversation is being had. I'm glad that the yeah. state is willing to Finally. put it on the ballot, right? And allow us, the voters, to determine uh, whether we'd like to uh, agree with it or not. Now, let me ask you this, Natalie. Uh, what are your thoughts for those individuals who were previously charged with possession? What and do you think should happen with I those individuals? It. Yeah, go for it. What do you think should yes. happen with those individuals? Definitely should be free. Like you said, records should be... Because I personally know people now that's locked up. Like you said, from simple possession, I, I have... I know people that's, that's doing years now. Mm. And unfortunately, like you said, from, you know, people who have been caught with, you know, big quantities. Um, but I think so unfair because, like you said, you can literally kill somebody nowadays, get a murder charge and get out quicker than people that's in their serving time behind marijuana. Right. Like I, I, I've personally known people who, like you said, who have has actually killed someone and got out sooner than, like you said, some people that are actually sitting in jail right now with marijuana charges. Um, so definitely, I think those people should be freed. Records should be cleared. Um, like, so unfair. Once again, like you said, just like when you were saying back in the days with the alcohol thing. Yep. You know, people were being locked up, taken away from their families. So, yeah, when you have people right now that are sitting in jail behind marijuana, but like you said, we can go in a store and purchase a cigarette or a vape pen, you know, that can really do harm. So, yeah, I think those people definitely should be freed um, and records cleared. Well, Natalie, thank you so much for hanging out with me this morning on Front Page Jacksonville and listening to the show. Greatly appreciate your comments. You are so welcome, and thank you so much for taking my call. My pleasure. Have a great one. You too. Thank you. I agree with Natalie. I'll put it to you like this. I don't smoke marijuana. I don't use it. Nor do I shun anyone who does. So am I for Amendment 3? Is Octavius against Amendment 3? Oh, what, what are his thoughts? I'm going to put it to you like this. I'm for anything that's going to prevent more black men from being put in prison. If yes on Amendment 3 is going to prevent more black men from being imprisoned, I'm for it. I'll go ahead and defuse any suspense for you. So I'm yes for Amendment 3 if it means people who look like me get to go free. I'm not Jesse Jackson, but I'm going to rhyme a little bit for you this morning. Huh? <laughs> if Amendment 3 is going to get people free to look like me, then I say yes. <laughs> Amendment 3 is for me. <laughs> Can I get an amen? <laughs> You're listening to Front Page Jacksonville. We got more coming up on the other side of the hour. Hi, 106.5. It's time now for Front Page Jacksonville, a show that delves into the issues that affect you. We believe in transparency and providing only the facts. And now, here's Octavius Davis. Welcome to Hour 2. If you are just tuning in, we were just wrapping up a discussion about Amendment 3. If you're not familiar with Amendment 3, Amendment 3 will make recreational use of marijuana legal here in the state of Florida. The estimated income, uh, or should, should I say economic, the estimated economic impact will be about up $200 million here in the state. Additionally, we discussed Helene, Hurricane Helene. We made it. All right. Hopefully you and your loved ones are safe. Uh, hopefully if you did experience any property damage, it was minimal. Uh, and if it wasn't minimal, hopefully you'll be able to uh, submit an insurance claim uh, to get that taken care of. We also spoke about Jalen Brown. If you're not familiar with Jalen Brown, he is the shooting guard for the Boston Celtics. He is launching his very own shoe. He turned down a $50 million deal from Nike because he said he was bored 
with what the current landscape of sneakers look like throughout the industry. So he wants to change the game. Well, he's rolling out his own shoe coming up pretty soon, the 741 Performance Rover. Men's sizes will average about $200. Kids in grade school, those shoes are going to cost you about 70 bucks. And we also looked at uh, or began the conversation about Florida Blue and Baptist Health. I don't know who your insurance provider is. My insurance provider is Florida Blue. So right now, Florida Blue and Baptist Health, they're in the middle of a little tussle, some contract negotiations. They have until October 1st. That is this Tuesday, the day after tomorrow, to come to terms. Otherwise, Baptist Health will be considered out of network for some 600,000 Florida Blue customers. Me and my family, we're part of that 600,000. We're part of that 600,000. We're part of that 600,000. I don't want to have my family be considered out of network because what is that going to look like? When you look at the out of network cost for doctor's visits, well, that, that has a domino effect on medications, specialists that you need to see. Come on, I need y'all to get this together. Now, I, I spoke with someone, and I'm not going to reveal any names, but I spoke with an inside source who works at Florida Blue. And what I'm being told is that part of the challenge is that Baptist Health wants 20 times the market rate. They want 20 times the market rate. I'm told that Florida Blue has already offered Baptist Health more than the market rate. Baptist Health said, nah, we want 20 times the market rate. And that's a part of what's causing this gridlock between the two. Now, Baptist Health maintains that they've taken on too many costs with workforce shortages, record inflation, and rising costs of drugs and supplies. They say all of that is coming into play. Well, I'm curious, Baptist Health. I'm curious, Florida Blue. And I have to put both of you here on the table, right? I have to hold the both of you accountable because I am a paying customer. I am one of the insured of Florida Blue coverage. Baptist Health, I understand what you're saying as it relates to your rising cost. And as I shared last hour, I have no clue what goes into running a hospital. No clue whatsoever. But if your costs are rising as a multi-billion dollar business, what do you think is happening to our cost as the insured, as the everyday person who's in need of medical coverage because it sounds like to me with this tussle happening right now between Florida Blue and Baptist Health the collateral damage is going to impact you and I for women who are pregnant right now who are expecting the the processes that they have to go through for coverage the, the there are certain forms and they only have a limited amount of time there are certain forms that have to be faxed over to certain healthcare providers for women who are expecting so that they can continue to get that coverage beyond October 1st and so again I don't know medical lingo. I don't know insurance jargon. I just know me and mine need some insurance. 
I just know that we need to make sure that when we got a boo-boo, we can go to the doctor and they take care of us. When we need our medications and our prescriptions, if we have to go and see a specialist, all I know is I want to be able to show that proof of insurance card so that me and my loved ones can get taken care of. And I'm sure it's the same for you and your loved ones. What are your thoughts on this situation going on right now between Florida Blue and Baptist Health? 833-758-1065 is the number to call. That's 833-758-1065. You're listening to Front Page Jacksonville. I'm your host, Octavius, the Million Dollar Voice Davis. And I'm actually, I'm actually joined by some guests in the studio. So we'll have an opportunity to get back to the Florida Blue and Baptist Health conversation in just a moment. But I'm joined by two guests here in the studio with me. And I have a question. Can anything good <laughs> come out of Nazareth? What you say, preacher? Now, this was a question <laughs> that was posed in the book of John, I believe. Because there was this hoopla about this cat from Nazareth. Mm-hmm. And and the gentleman said, can anything good come out of Nazareth? And so considering this is a Sunday morning, I have two guests in the studio with me right now. Dana Michelle, she is the creator and executive director for Moncrief Springs, which is a documentary that's preparing to come out. We have Yoli in the studio with us as well. And so my question for you ladies on this Sunday morning, can anything good come out of Moncrief? Well, well, well. Well, <laughs> well you know, the scripture followed that by saying a prophet is without honor in his own home. Huh? Well, Come on and so, now. You know, if we're going to talk about can anything good come out of the north side, yes. the answer is yes. yes. However, uh-huh. a yes. lot of people don't want to give honor where honor is due. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Can I get an amen? Oh, amen. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for having us, Octavius. Welcome, welcome, welcome <laughs> to Front morning. Page Jackson. I'm going to have you scoot over just a little bit more so you can get into the view of the camera here. I want to make sure that everybody on social media will have an opportunity uh, to see you as well. So let's, so I I, want to, there's a lot that we're going to have an opportunity to unpack and we won't be able to do it the entire hour, but I want to make certain that we're able to give our listeners a full understanding of this amazing project. So Dana, I'll start with you. What inspired you? to come out with this documentary, Moncrief Springs? So I started out um, really just being inspired by the neighborhood that I grew up in. That's my hood. My sure. grandmother um, lived in Magnolia Gardens, and that's where my mom grew up. She's a, a Reigns Viking. And so that's the community that is very ingrained in my childhood. And I was working for a nonprofit that allowed me to be in that community a lot. I was working at Earth's Farm and Market. It's a program that helps um, eradicate food deserts. Yeah. And as I was doing tours of the farm and getting to know the neighbors, I said, there's something here that we're not talking about enough. Yeah. And that's the work that the people are doing in the community, the people that live here, but the culture too. Mm-hmm. And so I, I have a degree in media production and I was like, I felt like this little, you know, this little calling. And I said, I got to go beyond just my day-to-day nine-to-five job at the nonprofit. I said, I got to make this a documentary. Mm. And I started kind of telling some friends about it. And it was like, well, do it. And I said, you going to help me do it? It was like, yeah. No, very quickly, give us an idea of the timeline. So you were working at... Um, at the farmer's market. Mm-hmm. What 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 year was that? And then when did it transition to a you? A year ago this summer. Whoa. I've been working on this oh, for wow. a year. Wow. Yeah. And it started out again just thinking I would tell a story, do like some film marketing sure. of the farm. And we just thought we need to go bigger. So I ended up leaving the nonprofit. I started producing the film full time. I met Yoli in my role at the farm because she's a tour guide. Mm -hmm. And so we were talking about how can we collaborate with her Mm -hmm. business, Explore Jack's Core at that time. And I said, Yoli, you're the historian. Help me tell the story. So that's how Yoli got involved. And so let's go to Yoli real quick. Mm -hmm. And uh, 
Then I'm going to have you come this way just okay. a little bit most. Come on into the camera, Yola. There, there we go. There we go, Yola. We, we got you <laughs> Is that now. better? There we go. Okay. So, Yoli, you are a tour guide. Uh, talk to us about your role as a tour guide and where exactly do you go throughout the city? Well, I'm Yoli. And thank you for having me. Dana. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Um, my role as a tour guide is to really detail Jacksonville's history. I am uh, African-American, clearly, and I'm the descendant of the American slave experience. And when I moved to Jacksonville, I realized there was hundreds, several hundreds of years were older than St. Augustine of, of history, and it wasn't being told mm. appropriately, I thought. And the black narrative definitely wasn't. I know there are waves. Sure. Of, you know, when someone will come and they'll do a thing and then, but at that moment in, in history, uh, no one was telling our story sufficiently. And so I go into the historically black neighborhoods, not all of them, because I use an electric vehicle. And my uh, starting point is downtown Jacksonville, the James Weldon Johnson Park. Yeah. And we go into about four or five historically black neighborhoods. Many of them don't exist anymore mm. because of urban removal, urban renewal, and things, and those policies that have harmed black and brown neighborhoods. Make, say that statement again. And those policies huh? that have harmed black and brown neighborhoods. Thank you, Yoli. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, we go to where all the old her, all ch historic churches are, but the neighborhoods don't exist. That would be Hanson Town, you yeah. know, which is adjacent to downtown, the first neighborhood you enter into. The other first neighborhood that you would have entered into was La Villa. It is Erased. Right, right. And then there was another. Yeah, so she's saying erased. Now, those of all that's listening on the radio and online, you can't see this, but I wanted to show you this map. Now, I'm going to give a disclaimer. We are partnering with Visit Jacksonville to okay. tell the story of Moncrief Springs. And so this particular magazine was produced by Visit Jacksonville, and I'm an ambassador of the North Side for Visit Jacksonville. But what they've done and what they've struggled to articulate is things to do in the North Side. So we are on the South Side in your studio, yep. somewhere over here. You see all these icons, you see these labels, South yep. Side, Mandarin, San Marco. But when you look at the Northwest mm. Quadrant, what do you notice? There's nothing. Right. Literally. There's no labels, no landmarks. That's the erasure. Wow. And so we know that most of Jacksonville's uh, black historic neighborhoods are in this northwest quadrant, Durkeyville, yep. Moncrief Springs, Sherwood, Brentwood, uh, Harborview. Sugar Hill. But Sugar Hill. None of that is here. And even when you think about the state's oldest historically black college, Edward Waters University is Newtown. not marked here. Right. New, Newtown. Yeah. Newtown is not here. And so the documentary is really my efforts to give us some agency, reclaim my time, put our name on the map, yeah, literally. literally. Because yeah. I always tell people this, when you invest in the North Side, you invest in Jacksonville. So you can't be doing a Duval chant to talk about Duval and all that, but you overlook the North Side. Well, because let's let's call it what it is. Mm -hmm. Came up in Jacksonville. Duval, that chant was ours. It's right. still right. ours. Right. Other people use it, but they don't yeah, give us credit for it. Trademarked and, and, so, and co-opted and appropriated. Exactly, because I, I want to say maybe 2017, 2018 is when the Jaguars released that right. statement about them uh, trademarking the Duval. For, and you talk about a problem mm -hmm. on social media amongst the African-American community because right. that has been ours right. for so long. Right. I remember catching the bus when I was in middle school listening to 92.7 yeah. <laughs> to Beat Jam. And who come on the radio talking about do right. right. So it's ours. And, we, and I think what we have to do is we have to own it and we have to tell the story behind it. Sure. Right. Yes. I go to the airport and I, I used to live in um, Houston, Texas, and I'd be coming home, and they're like, where you going? I'm going to Jacksonville. They say, Duval. Anywhere you <laughs> go, they know the Duval can, but they don't know, they they know, they don't know the story behind it. Right. And so now you're preparing to tell this story that has been uh, lost amongst uh, many people. Yes. So talk to us a little bit about <laughs> the areas that the uh, Moncrief Springs documentary covers. Right, so we're going to all the historic black neighborhoods in this first phase. Okay. So we're looking at Newtown, which uh, some are referring to as the Rail Yard District, but the original name of that community is Newtown because of the porters and the people who work on the trains. 
Then we're going up Myrtle Avenue to Durkeyville. Durkeyville uh, is the epicenter for baseball. The Negro League mm-hmm, played in mm-hmm. Durkeyville. Hank Aaron lived in Durkeyville. We go a little further to Moncrief. Moncrief Springs, Moncrief Park. We're still doing some research to identify the proper name of that community. Yeah. But there was a spring on Moncrief Road right past wow. Golf Fair yes. that a lot of people don't know about because in the 60s when they built I-95, it choked out the water. And so where the uh, tributaries were flowing from the St. John's River into the Moncrief Creek, mm-hmm. it's dried up. Yes. Mm-hmm. And then we go a little bit further. Moncrief goes all the way down to Sutel, and that's when you get to uh, Magnolia Gardens and the Sherwood area. And we um, interview Angie Nixon at the Band Bookstore, Cafe mm-hmm. Resistance. We're covering the Northwest Classic this weekend to talk about the Reigns Rebalt culture and that um, history. So we're looking at everything along the Moncrief Myrtle Avenue corridor to talk about black businesses, black historical landmarks, Marks and the culture and how the tourism industry could really economically stimulate mm-hmm. this northwest part of town. So Martinique Lewis, the creator mm-hmm. of ABC Travel Green Book and the host of Black Travel Across America uh, that's seen on Disney Plus. How did you get connected with her for this project? <laughs> that's my sister friend. And, and even just saying her name makes me so happy because she has been a blessing to me. I met her through my work at the farm. I met her through Visit Jacksonville. Same here. Visit Jacksonville um, Mm -hmm. sent her through Yoli Mm -hmm. to tour Eartha's Farm. And as a community outreach person, I was hosting the tour and got to meet her, showed her um, the apiary, the beekeeping apiary, um, showed her uh, our Quonset hut, just showing her what urban agriculture looked like. And she was just interested in the history with Eartha White and black businesses. And so I told her that at that time, this was just a seed of an idea. Yeah. I said, you know, Marty, you're a black travel advocate and we really have a lot of stuff here in Jacksonville that a lot of black travelers would love. Would you help me do this documentary? Listen, let me tell you how the Lord came through. <laughs> it is said, a Sunday morning. So listen, go ahead testimony time, testimony. Hey, man. Well, Sis told me, just get me there, <laughs> make sure you have my lodging and there's no fee. Wow. And I'm telling you, I'm I'm an independent filmmaker and, you know, it costs a lot of money to do films and it starts with your talent. And she is top tier. I mean, I'm talking that Geo, Disney Plus, that's heavy. And her project was still new. So this is 24. So her project that came out in 22, 23. Mm, I'm not sure. It was 23. I came toured out with 23. her last year. Yeah, it was okay. 23. No, I toured with her the year before. Yeah, and so when Black Travel Across America came out, she was hot. And yeah. she and I just became very sweet friends, and I asked her to be a part of the project, and she said yes, and that was that was awesome. And, and I'm actually going to be with her in two weeks for the Black Travel Summit, and um, we're going to be talking about Ma Cree Springs, the documentary, and some other projects that she's doing because she's an advocate for content creators who are in the travel industry. Mm-hmm. So we're talking all things black, all things travel, all sure. things right now for the north side of Jacksonville. Woo-hoo. So a few quick questions for you before we wrap because we're coming up against the class. Okay. How can our listeners get a hold of Moncrief Springs documentary? When is it releasing? So the goal is to have the film complete and ready to premiere in 2025. Um, They can find me on Instagram. My link is in the bio. And that's how you can help support by giving. So like I already said, making a film ain't cheap. There you go. And I like to to pay my (laughs) artists. I like to pay my partners. um, And so they can contribute that way. I do have these new shirts that's coming out. I don't know if they can see it. Northside Pride. And so you can purchase a shirt. That's a great way to donate. I got one for you too, brother. Oh, well, thank you. You're going to rock one that day. I will definitely rock it. Um, But definitely, um, Moncree Springs underscore the movie on Instagram or you can find me Dana Michelle underscore 904 on Instagram and of course I'm on Facebook as well ask me about my Chris Springs ask me how you can get involved I might be in your hood and you might be on a, you might be in the documentary you might be in the background you might be in the front ground I don't know but that's how they could do that so one of the biggest takeaways uh, in addition to the amazing documentary that you're working on but very quickly I would be remiss if I didn't acknowledge the importance of a network impacting your net worth. That's right. Because for both Yoli as well as Martinique, you mentioned that both of them you met at Eartha Farms. Yes. We'd be remiss if we did not give a huge shout out to Councilwoman 
Jacoby Pittman. Yeah. Because yeah. without her efforts through the Clara White mission, mm -hmm. which then transitioned into Earth of Farms, yeah. there would not have been this opportunity mm -hmm. uh, for agriculture being able to revitalize and uh, uh, alleviate um, food deserts mm -hmm. there on the north side. So just wanted to take a quick moment to, to show Councilwoman Jacoby Knowledge. Pittman mm -hmm. uh, yeah. some love. So Dan, if you would please uh, once again share with our listeners how they can learn more about Moncree Springs and also the virtual collection plate. How, how can they put a little <laughs> coin in your virtual collection plate? Yes, so sponsorships are available if you have an organization or a business that would align with any of these to topics. We're talking about neighborhood preservation. We're talking about tourism. We are talking about resilience and sustainability. Ability. We are talking about, you know, programs that help eradicate food deserts. And we're talking about black businesses yes. and economics. And so if any of that aligns with you, we'd love for you to be a partner. Um, I do want to give a shout out to Visit Jacksonville, St. John's River Keeper, and Black Films Matter, along with Explore Jack's Core and Jack's Film Lab, who have already partnered with me thus far. But we want to finish this thing and we yeah. want to get it out there so that people can see. And this is a documentary um, that is made for us and by us. And I want people, when they see it, to feel proud. Yeah. I want people to be repping Reigns, repping Reball, representing the North Side. And you're from Jacksonville, right? Uh, Where you graduated Reigns, from? Reigns, but uh, well, I graduated. What's you see now? You get Let's, see, see, I, we see. got time for that. Oh, we, do we, we have we, time we got, for that? We got, like, we got like two minutes. Okay, so not born in Jacksonville, but raised in Jacksonville. Okay. This is home for me. Okay. Um, graduated from Sandalwood. Okay. Sandalwood. But, 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 Sandalwood. Huh? but, you see how she puts it, like, 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 like a little up here, you know, but, Jacksonville. but uh -huh. I am a proud graduate of the emerging eminence, yes. Edward oh. Waters Bravo. University. Huh? Huh? All huh? right, tigers. Yeah, right. I, am. I, I am a tiger. Okay. So I, I need Dana, to I feel like you was questioning my blackness for a moment. I'm, I'm like, hey, we have to do an assessment. We have to find out who you are and where you are. You, you qualify. Thank you, million dollar voice. Thank you, million dollar voice. You qualify. You made it in. So thank you. Thank you. You made it in. Moncrief Springs, if you would, uh, support, support, yes. support. Support. Uh, Dana made mention about the organization Black Films Matters that's in support of the Moncrief Springs project, but black films do indeed matter. Mm -hmm. So Dana, give the social media handles once again of where they can find you. Moncrief Springs underscore the movie. Moncrief Springs underscore the movie. Thank you so much, Dana Michelle Yoli. Thank you for hanging out with us here on no Front Page Jacksonville. And we'll have more coming your way in just a moment. Now back to the show that informs you and discusses the issues. Front Page Jacksonville on Hot 106.5. Hey, welcome back. If you're just tuning in, you missed a great conversation with Dana Michelle, the executive director and creator of Moncrief Springs, a documentary that's releasing in 2025, was also joined by Yoli. Uh, Yoli is a tour guide here in the city of Jacksonville. Phenomenal phenomenal opportunity uh, to support that project. Uh, Moncrief Springs documentary is where you can find them on social media if you'd like to get involved and support. So depending upon what side of town you live on and where you send your kids to go to school, there's something that's going on uh, throughout DCPS right now, Duval County Public Schools, where there are some schools that are on the cusp of potentially experiencing closure. That's King's Trail, Annie R. Morgan, Don Brewer, Susie Talbert, George Washington Carver, and Hidden Oaks Elementary Schools. Well, joining us this morning is one of the school board uh, directors, uh, one of the directors of the Duval County School Board, Mr. Daryl Willie. Daryl, how are you this morning, sir? At the top of the morning. I'm good. How are you? Uh, doing excellent. Thank you so much for hanging out with us here on Front Page Jacksonville on a Sunday morning. Now, Daryl, I know that you've been deep in the educational game here in the city of Duval, <laughs> the city of Duval, the city of Jacksonville. We may as well call it the city of Duval. They need to change that. Let's go ahead and call it the city of Duval. <laughs> That's um, it. Call it. Talk to us about what's going on right now with the possibility of these schools closing throughout the city. Uh, how are things looking from the school board side? Yeah, thanks for the, the question. Thanks for the opportunity. Always a pleasure to, to have conversations with, with you as well as all the listeners. We, we just have to realize the changing landscape of education. That's what I've been really mm -hmm. trying to harp on for, uh, for our community. If you think back to 
10, 15 years ago, the traditional schools, Duval County Public Schools, was the only option, really, for families and students. Uh, but now, if, as you fast forward in, in this current state, you have charter schools, you have virtual schools, you have private vouchers. So you have so many options. And because of that, families are, are choosing some of those various options. And we've probably lost around 10,000 students over that span. So we have to realize that we have the same number of school buildings, but 10,000 less students. So we can't operate effectively and efficiently with taxpayer dollars with the same amount of buildings and rooftops, as we say. So we, we had to make some tough decisions, and we haven't made that decision yet. That vote is going to be coming up this Tuesday, but that decision is figuring out how we create efficiencies across our system, and that means potential closures or consolidations of schools, as you just mentioned. And, Daryl, those are some excellent points that you made mention of because the landscape of education has changed, not just here in Jacksonville, but across the country especially. Yes. And so if I remember correctly, I think it's like a, a close to a $3 billion deficit right now uh, that the city is dealing with as it relates to some of these schools, which is leading to some of these closures. Is that correct? Yeah, it's about a $1.4 billion deficit. And it, it's not a, a whole. What it is is that we forecast it out. And that's what we have to do as a board. We have to look into the future to see where we are. And it comes up because we just went to the voters and they voted on a have any sales tax to actually go towards capital improvements. Capital improvements are to go towards building of infrastructure, buildings and, and re renovating buildings. And if you look at that plan, that plan is it, it costs way more to do now than it did when we voted for it because of COVID, rising costs of construction, labor, all those pieces. So if you laid over all the projects we were supposed to do and we, we said we were going to do and sort of built that out into the course of the 15 years, it would be a $1.4 billion hole. Mm -hmm. So what we have to do is go back and sort of retweak that plan like any good sort of operational sort of entity would do to figure out how do we move forward. And that's where we are. And we, we have to do that now. It would be irresponsible of us to just continue to just do the uh, and operate the same way we've been operating. So we had to take a pause, really invest the community. And I'm sure we'll talk about how many uh, community voices were involved to get us to this point today. Absolutely. And, and that's kind of leading uh, where I'm going now with this next question. Of the six schools that I mentioned, how were those schools determined in the potential closure process? Yeah, there's a lot of factors that went into it. So when you think about um, any any time you have to close a school, it's, it's never fun. It's not easy. These schools are, are jewels and gems in our neighborhoods and many families and generations of folks have gone to many of them. I'm sure you you saw the article and saw folks coming out. Yep. When we look at our plan, you have to think about, number one, what, what, is that school at, at utilization? We have utilization number of around 85% that we're trying to go for. And some of our smaller schools cost more money to run than our sort of mid to larger size schools. Just cost effectiveness. So if you have 700 is the number that we always aim for or we're currently aiming for for our elementary schools. Uh, because that's the number that if you get the dollars from the state for that student and that mix, it actually goes to cover that. If you're at 300 or 400, you're actually, your school costs more than we are getting to run it. So you're actually having to borrow money from these bigger schools. So that utilization is one. Also, you're looking at neighborhoods that have multiple schools near them. So we're not leaving any school deserts for families. Um, so that was the second factor. And the third factor, we did put into play um, performance. We wanted to make sure the schools that are, are consolidated or open are some of the higher performing schools are performing at a good level. So families, when they are making that choice, know that they're getting a good academic option for their family. And you mentioned about just familiarity with those schools. I myself attended two of the schools that's on this list. Uh, I was wow. at Susie wow. Talbert for a very previous uh, period of time, and I transferred and went to George Washington Carver. Uh, so okay. Carver is close to my heart. Carver is near and dear to my heart. <laughs> uh, so, so let's talk about the, yeah. the community and just some of the pushback uh, that you all may have seen from the community and uh, just comments from the community with the potential closures. Yeah, we, we knew that this is that it's never easy. Like these conversations aren't easy. And, and I got on the school board to make decisions that would be helpful for our, our city and our community, our schools going down the line. And I think as painful as it, as it is, it, it'll be, it's going to be more painful if we don't take these steps or these actions, because we're going to see even more schools close if we don't kind of come together and figure out how do we create 
uh, a better environment. So we, what we did in the very beginning and when we started was had um, a consultant come and say, give us, give us the, the, uh, a plan, a bold, like very aggressive plan. And, and we did that in the sunshine as a board member, we have to do everything in front of everyone because we can't have backroom conversations. Mm, yeah. And when we had that, we knew it was going to, to cause, uh, raise, raise some eyebrows a bit about what we were doing. Um, and we tried to tell folks, Hey, this is sort of just the initial conversation and we'll be iterating this plan along the way. So what happened was we had that plan. There's a number of schools. There was probably 30 or 30 some schools that were on that list at first. Right. And we knew that that probably wasn't going to be the final plan, but what happened was fam- families and communities and, and even students were emailing and they made yard signs and pick and, and t-shirts, uh, to, to protect and save their school, which, Honestly, the silver lining in all of that, folks are finding out about the great quality of education going on in their neighborhood schools like they haven't before because folks didn't have to or, or, or weren't really sort of doing that sort of organic marketing that they were. So right. um, we have heard from them in some various circles, community groups. We had seven listening sessions in every school board district. We had focus groups. We invited, invited uh, different representatives from schools into those meetings. And now the recommendation is front of, in front of us as a board. And I'm sure, like like you mentioned, man, for community members to rally for their school, to try to save their school, uh, you always love to see that. But, of course, as you mentioned, at the end of the day, some tough decisions are going to still have to be made. Yeah. As a community, uh, how what can we do at this point to support? Not necessarily to keep the doors open of the schools, because I recognize that some of those school doors are going to close. But as a community, how can we support DCPS and how can we get involved uh, for the community as a whole, even if these schools do close? Right. I think there's a couple of couple of ways. One thing I always encourage folks to do is get involved in the school now, volunteer, be on, on a SAC committee, which is, or PTA, which is the committees that involve and understand the school because what we have right now is we have a unique opportunity as a school district where we offer uh, so many different programs that other schooling options don't. And and that's something that we just have to make sure that we're marketing, we're boasting, we're pushing. In fact, I am, um, my, my area consists of a, of a variety of schools. I have your traditional African-American schools. I have Revolt in my area, I have First Coast, but I also have Stanton. Um, and all of those schools are doing really well when you look at graduation rates, um, really well. And in fact, Stanton just got a blue ribbon uh, award. It's one of wow. the few high schools in the country that got recognized by the Department of Education in the country for that. So, I mean, you, we have great schooling options, but unfortunately, we don't hear enough about the positive things that are happening within our schools. And I think folks that are involved, you get involved in a SAC or PTA you throw that information on Facebook or social media about the experience you're having and all the great programs that are there. That is what we need to sort of invest and have that B, uh, B12 shot, so to speak, yep. to go into our system so folks hear about the great things going on. Well, Daryl, listen, I really appreciate you as well as your fellow council, excuse me, board members of DCPS continuing to push education forward here in the city of Jacksonville. I recognize it is not an easy task. So not thank you so much for everything that you do. Uh, Daryl Willie with the Duval County School Board hanging out with us today here on Front Page Jacksonville. Thanks so much, Daryl. Appreciate you hanging out with us, sir. All right. Anytime, every time. Thanks. All right. And we have more coming your way right here on Front Page Jacksonville. I'm Octavius Davis. Front Page Jacksonville resumes on Hot 106.5. If you're just tuning in, we had one of the members of the Duval County School Board, Daryl Willie, join us a few moments ago speaking about some of the potential school closures that are coming up. The, the board will be voting on it this Tuesday. Those schools that are being threatened to close, Kings Trail, Annie R. Morgan, Don Brewer, Susie Talbert, George Washington Carver, and Hidden Oaks. There was actually an email that went out last week to parents who attend, whose students attend each of those schools. Uh, the email read along the lines that you are probably already aware that our school district has been considering potential school closures and consolidations in response to multiple financial challenges. I'm writing today to inform you that the current version of the proposal plan includes the closure of our school at the conclusion of this school year. And those potential closures, of course, being the schools that I just rattled off. As I mentioned to Daryl, 
I used to attend both Susie Talbert and George Washington Carver. As a matter of fact, uh, Susie Talbert used to be considered a sixth grade center. So I attended Susie Talbert. I did not like it at Susie Talbert. I'm going to be honest with you. I didn't like it. Didn't like it not one bit. And so my two best friends at that time, they attended George Washington Carver. So, you know, I went home. Oh, mama. Mama, if you please allow me to transfer to this other school. Oh, please, mama. So eventually, mom, she gave in. And I transferred to Susie. Oh, excuse me. I then tra- transferred to George Washington Carver. Here's what happened when I went to George Washington Carver. George Washington Carver had a dance program. I used to love, I still love dancing, but as a kid in particular, I loved dancing. I lived for the dance. So I went to George Washington Carver, my two former best friends, they were part of the dance program. I had an opportunity to join the dance program, then became a choreographer with the dance program. This is where I earned the name, the Dancing Urkel. (laughs) (laughs) I used to look like Steve Urkel's twin brother in sixth grade. Thank you, Wanda. I appreciate your agreement. Thank you. (laughs) I used to look like Steve Urkel's twin brother, and they would call me the dancing Urkel. At school dances, when the music would drop, it was MC Hammer, of course. MC Hammer, boys to men, and I would get out there and start doing my thing. All the students, go Urkel, go Urkel. That was the chant. (laughs) I kid you not, that was the chant. So before I became the million dollar voice, I was the million dollar feet. (laughs) Because my voice didn't change like this until I was preparing to transition into eighth grade. So had it not been for George Washington Carver, the, the level of confidence that I was able to gain through dancing, Ms. Gaffney was our dance teacher. So, Daryl, I understand the school board. Y'all got votes to do on Tuesday. I get that. But I'm sorry. I'm going to have to round up the crew. We're going to go old school, break into Electric Boogaloo. We got to save miracles. Okay, we're going to have a a dance benefit concert to raise money to save George Washington Carver. All right? (laughs) Hey, you're listening to Front Page Jacksonville. I'm your host, Octavius Davis. If you'd like to jump in, we have a few minutes left on the show. The number to dial is 833-758-1065. That's 833-758-1065. Here are the different topics we had an opportunity to discuss today. So if you'd like to jump in and share your thoughts on any of these comments, you're more than welcome. Uh, Most recently, we spoke about the potential DCPS school closures. We also had Dana Michelle. She is the creator and executive director for the Moncrief Springs documentary that she's preparing to bring in 2025. She's been able to have some phenomenal supporters of this project and you can be one of these supporters so go to Moncrief Springs Moncrief Springs documentary is how you can find her on social media and Instagram we also spoke about amendment three what are your thoughts on amendment three now if you're not familiar with amendment three the long and short of it is this would be the legalization of recreational marijuana in the state of Florida Now, you must be 21 years or older to possess or purchase or use, all right? And here's the thing. Even if Floridians vote yes on Amendment 3 in November and it passes, you can't simply go to your plug to get your recreational fix. No, 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 no. It must be a medical marijuana treatment center and other state licensed entities state licensed entities to acquire, cultivate, process, manufacture, sell, and distribute such products. I understand your plug has been hooking you up and it's legal now, so what the problem is. I get that, but there will still be regulations. There will still be laws in place. So you wanna make certain that we go about it the right way if you want to be able to get that recreational use. We also spoke about NBA player Jalen Brown, how he's launching his own sneaker, the 741 Performance Rover, and you'll have an opportunity to support that if you would like. So I encourage you to to Google Jalen Brown and 741 Performance Rover if you'd like to get the shoe. Hey, caller, you on front page Jacksonville. How are you this morning? I'm great. How are you? Doing excellent. Thank you so much for calling. What's your name? 
My name is Ryan Sinclair. Hey, Mr. Sinclair. Ryan, Ryan. Ryan, Ryan what's up, brother? <laughs> yeah, I'm fabulous, man. How are you? Oh, man, it is great to hear your voice, sir. Oh, what uh, what would you like Thanks to jump on and talk about this morning? I was talking about that uh, mar- uh, marijuana. Yes, sir. Amendment 3, what do you got? I was thinking about the impact it would have on folks who can't afford assurance to get medical marijuana. Mm. I mean, you, know, you know how sometimes you... Your doctor prescribes that that high-priced prescription Tylenol, but you can go to the counter and get the -the over-the-counter Tylenol. Right. And I have some friends that use medical marijuana, but they can't afford insurance. Mm. So they're kind of stuck with trying to get it from wherever they can get it from, you know, which makes some more illegality with them getting it from somebody who has a car or they have to get it off the street. Right. And if it was... um. If it was approved for recreational use, they would be able to go by over the counter to probably alleviate some of their pains and anxiety and things like that. Yep. Um, and I thought about that impact. And then the other impact would be that doctors could concentrate on some other things so they can just, you know, tell them, go get you some over the counter so and so. And you, you know, you'll be okay, which yep. would probably decrease the um, drain on the medical institution. Mm. Uh, you know, and and also, like you said, it would ensure the purity so that they wouldn't get something that's laced with something else so they'd be hooked on the other substance and have to have that, this, that, and the other. Excellent points, as Ryan. Far as the, no, no, uh, keep going, brother. Yeah, keep people, going. As far as the people that have been arrested for them small amounts, I think that should be, you know, they should be expunged. If that was, you know, if that was for personal use and personal consumption, and they can verify that. Because I know a lot of people that claim they have a problem when they get arrested with drugs just to get out of jail time. But, um, you know, and the other lady made the point that it's way safer. I'd rather have some people hide my party then somebody drunk at my party. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know what? You, when you're right, you're right, Ryan. I cannot argue with that fact. <laughs> Listen, bro, you got a party and they tripping? Yeah. Like, mm, calm down. Yeah, just put on some Seals and Crawls <laughs> or some uh, October London. And they all right. Like, oh, yeah. <laughs> you know, it's taking too long to even remember why they fighting, so. Right, right. You know, yeah. No, it's right. the benefits of a lot more peace. I mean, back in the day, we used to think that if if the president and the Russian czar would smoke a joint, we probably wouldn't be fighting right now. <laughs> It'd help relax them some, yeah. huh? Little yeah, headed, big headed. It's going to be okay. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and um, not from um, personal experience, but everybody that I know smoking. It's a lot mellow unless they ain't got no more. <laughs> so keep, <laughs> you know. keep, keep, they, keep their supply up and they'll be okay. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, Ryan, thank you so much, man. We appreciate you hanging out with us this morning on Front Page Jacksonville, man. Good hearing from you as always. Man, listen, this show here is my new station. Oh, man. Thank you, brother. Thank you. That's a huge compliment coming from you. And Wanda P. Well, said I appreciate hi. the fact. I appreciate where I want to tell her I say hi. He said hi. <laughs> you know, I appreciate the, the candidacy and the honesty of things and yes, not con- not convoluting it with your opinion. Yes, sir. My, my, I'm humbly uh, grateful and, and thankful for the opportunity. Thank you, Doc. Thank you, sir. Yes, sir. We keep on doing it. Yes, sir. We'll do. It need to be about three hours, but we still got to have that gospel, too. So we yeah, gotta, you got you to get your gospel in on a Sunday. Time. After after your friend you know. wink wink have mm-hmm. their marijuana. <laughs> mm-hmm. Thanks, yeah, brother. You appreciate your brother. <laughs> they get close. They be closer to God. <laughs> <laughs> All right, man. Have a great one. <laughs> All right, Doctor. You too. Thank you, sir. <laughs> yeah, no, yeah. My friends, uh, man. My, my my friends. Uh, they 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 smell. Oh, your friends, huh? Okay, okay, Ryan. Wink wink. I got you. Your friends. Okay. But, you know, he he brought up a really great point in regards to uh, just the cost. You know, what will the cost look like? Will it be more affordable uh, for people to be able to utilize uh, their their marijuana? So, man, Front Page Jacksonville, I tell you, uh, it has been an outstanding show today. As we get ready to wrap up, here's what I want you to think about. 
validation. What does the word validation mean to you? Now, I can tell you what validation means to me because a couple of weeks ago, I had a situation where I felt validated beyond what words can fully express. So I'm going to attempt to vocalize that to you in this very brief monologue. I've been in radio, had been in radio for years. And honestly, I made a decision to walk away from it altogether, was done with it because I was disappointed that the outcomes were not what I believed they should be. I, for one, believed that radio is an extension of my purpose. I believed that everything that is built on the inside of me is for the purpose of communicating, motivating, and entertaining. But I found myself up against circumstances and situations that were contrary to what I believed. And over a period of time, what I believed began to diminish to the point where I said, you know what, well, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe this whole, you know, purpose and calling thing, maybe I'm off base with that. So I was like, I'm done. I'm done with this radio thing. I'm going to pursue other avenues, other ventures, and had been doing so for years and was quite content until I got a phone call from a person who shall go nameless, Wanda P. (laughs) About this show called Front Page Jacksonville and this program director named Elroy Smith the director of programming for Hot 106.5, having an opportunity to interact with him. And long story short, he said, Octavius, listen, this is something that you were born to do. I've had a chance to hear a lot of announcers. There's something different about you. Those years of doubting myself and those years of advocating myself became vindicated in that moment. Now, I know what I believe, but it's different when you have other people on the other side that are supporting you to help push what you believe as well, pushing you towards your purpose. So to Wanda P., to Elroy Smith, I want to thank you so very much for validating what I've always believed about myself. And so for you who's listening to this right now, continue believing in yourself. If you haven't got the external validation, hold on to that internal validation because your moment is coming. Thank you so much for hanging out with me this week. Look forward to seeing you next time right here on Front Page Jacksonville. I'm Octavius Davis. Front Page Jacksonville, Sundays from 6 a.m. to 8 a.m. For show episodes, go to Hot1065FM.com. We are Hot1065.